Now let's look at designing permaculture sites for different types of climates. Three main types of climates. They're very general, but certain types of uh, methods and structures are used to design sustainable permaculture sites in the tropics. And there's another set of uh, principles and methods used in temperate climates and also different ones in dry lands. Let's start off first with tropical climates. In general, in tropical climates, we have a lot of water, a lot of humidity, a lot of sunshine. So your, your challenges are to reduce water on the roots, and that is done through earth mounding, ridges, swales, where there's an um, above ground or above the normal soil level area, you mound up the soil to plant plants on that. So their roots are um, in soil that's well drained the water is draining away from those mounds or ridges instead of sitting on the roots because if you in tropical areas if you plant plants in a depression you'll have water sitting there on the roots too long and it will rot the roots so up pushing up with the soil and getting the plants up out of the um the really wet zone of the soil and that's done again with the mounding and ridges and swales also in tropical climates, the nutrients are cycled so quickly because of the, of the humidity and the warmth and all the, um, the rain that you have a lot of decomposition happening. So nutrients tend to be um, sucked up by the plants quickly and the soil tends to be nutrient poor. So you've got to keep focusing on enriching the nutrient levels in the soil. Mulching, adding lots of living mulches and organic mulches are, is a really helpful way of doing that. It also helps protect the soil from erosion by creating a protective layer on the soil from all the rain that comes down. Um, living mulches are a great idea in the tropics too. You have something that grows for a period of time that covers the soil and enriches the soil and perhaps even improves its nutrient quality like legumes, which will um, enrich the soil with nitrogen and uses, using those as a cover crop or planting and then chopping it down at the end of the season and letting it be a mulch and let it decompose. So, um, and then related to that is building up the normally thin tropical soils. You think of the tropics as lush and beautiful and lots of trees and plants and vegetation, and that's all true. Um, but the fact that it's so humid and warm and lots of precipitation means that uh, as soon as, a, let's just take for example, like a leaf falling out of a tropical tree, it falls down, but it's so moist and warm there that it um, decomposes very quickly. Microbial action will decompose that leaf very quickly, releasing the nutrients in that leaf back into the soil. And there's so many plants that it gets, those nutrients get absorbed very quickly. So the soils don't tend to um, have time to build up to any thick, rich level because they're um, sucked dry of nutrients so quickly. Where you see thicker, more fertile soils in the world are areas usually in temperate climates where you have a growing season where everything grows really well in the spring and into the summer and then it, a winter comes where it's cold and there's dormancy with the plants all that organic matter that got built up during the growing season um, if it's leaves and things like annuals and grasses all that dies back and lays on the ground and it doesn't get reabsorbed by growing plants because the plants are dormant. So in temperate areas where there's winters and summers, you get soil, rich soil buildup. In tropics, you do not because everything's growing all the time. So for us humans, it's great to go to the tropics and relax. I think for animals and plants living in the tropics, it is very competitive and very busy for them all year long. But those are some of the main strategies that permaculture designers will use in tropical climates, trying to work with the climate um, and make your design or their designs more sustainable. Here's a case study in tropical permaculture design. I lived in Guatemala for a year in 1997 through 98, um, and it was we lived in the eastern portion of Guatemala. If you look at the map, it's um, in a sense kind of like New York, I always say. Although um, the eastern portion of Guatemala um, has just a very small um, exposure to the ocean, and that's the Gulf side. Um, unlike New York, the rest of New York is inland and um, land bound, but the western shore of, of Guatemala is on the west coast of um, Central America. 
So where we lived was right near the East Coast. And um, you can see a little lake in that map. Um, it's about a half an hour boat ride from <clears throat> the East Coast um, up to the place where we lived. And it was a lowland tropical rainforest. And this is an area where um, the Kekchi Mayans had um, migrated to fleeing the violence of their 39 year civil war that ended in around 1995. So it was a very long civil war. And the Kekchi Mayans, one of many uh, Mayan cultural groups that live in Guatemala and have been indigenous there for a long, long time. They live in kind of the central highlands of Guatemala, but they were, they, there was a lot of violence between the government fighting the, um, the revolutionary non-government faction. And that was, um, they fled, a lot of families fled the violence in their um, homelands, especially the Kekchi, and they moved uh, east towards the ocean. And so after about, well, this was almost 40 years of fleeing violence, the families that we worked with were pretty much newcomers in the sense they hadn't lived there for probably more than um, 10 or 20 years um, to these Eastern tropical lowland climates. And they were from a higher altitude, cooler, drier, not tropical um, uh, climate. So they uh, were having some struggles with nutrition and crops and, and their diet. Um, so I went there and um, I was helping build a permacultural garden. Well, we didn't set out to do permaculture. I just went there to help with their, um, their nutritional problems and see if, what I could do. And I came on as a um, you know, farmer, botanist, person who knew about plants and how to grow things and um, to try to get the, uh, more crops being grown by the local people um, that had vitamin A and um, uh, iron. Those are the deficiencies we're seeing in the women, mostly um, due to the fact that they, their foods they were eating were low in iron and low in vitamin A. And what we found out while we were there is the reason that they were having nutritional deficiencies in those two nutrients was um, if some, the things that had those in them, like um, papayas, anything that's orange has a lot of vitamin A in it, like carrots or um, papayas, those things, if they grew them, which was rare, um, they, they had a good market value, so they'd sell those things. And they would also, um, greens, um, other things that had a lot of iron in them, they would often grow them, but they would, have to, they would sell them for money. And what they were left with eating mostly was just corn and beans, and that will leave you pretty deficient after a while. So, travel there, and I found, um, I kind of got, uh, um, became aware of permaculture while I was down there. And that seemed like a really good method to use to, to um, develop a farm that could grow lots of different kinds of foods to show some of the local people if they wanted to diversify their crops and to help their own nutrition. Um, and it, it's so sustainable and so localized, permaculture is. So we could not go anywhere and get compost. We could barely get seeds. We, you know, tools were hard to come by. So everything we needed, almost everything had to come from right in the very, very micro local um, area. And that's how permaculture is meant to be used. You try to um, decrease your inputs to a site and build up the, um, the natural capital of the site using local things as much as possible. That's a regenerative and sustainable type of design. So that was our ideal. We used permaculture and developed a small garden there. Um, and I, I learned and tried some of these um, strategies for working in tropical climates there. Here's a um, outside picture of the actual place. It was called Proyecto Octenamit, and that was created with and for the Kekchi Mayans. There was about 40 villages that lived in the area, and they, um, uh, it was a, a man from Florida who started this whole project, who went down there and started working with some of these people and realized they had a, a, a pretty significant need for um, some educational facilities and for basic um, medical care. And then he brought me down to help with the agricultural nutritional gardening part. Um, it's right on the Rio Dulce, which is a river. It goes from an inland lake out to the East Coast Ocean, the Caribbean. And um, in the upper left picture is a slide. I, this was a while ago. This is like I said in 1997, 98. 
and I had a camera with me. And you know, in those days, you, you took 35 millimeter slides if you wanted to show pictures of these to other people. So that slide I, I had it there, and you can see on the edges, it's getting kind of black. It looks like it's in bad condition. That's because the slide started to mold. Everything molded while we were there. There's so much warmth and moisture and heat and, um, and humidity that everything molds. That, that 35 millimeter camera rusted, basically molded and decomposed while I was there. Leather shoes decomposed within a month or two. Um, but it was really easy to do composting because of that. Um, but it's just kind of a, I point that out because um, it provides some serious challenges for agriculture when you have that um, warm and humid of an environment. The great thing about the tropics, which I've already said, is that everything breaks down very quickly. Um, this was a, we decided to use that strategy after I got introduced to permaculture and some of the techniques. Um, and I, I also learned about ancient Mayan techniques, thinking they might be a little bit more um, uh, acceptable to the Kekchi Mayans. Um, the, the current day modern Kekchi Mayans might say, oh, you know, that technique looks interesting or reminds me of something that they had seen in the past. Um, but of building up these beds, um, so you want to raise your beds above the, the normal soil level because you want to get the roots up off of the soggy soil in the tropics where it's already so wet. And these are just natural um, organic plant materials from around that site that we layered to build the soil up. So we've got um, some water hyacinth in the upper left that came from the river. Since it's an aquatic plant, it would be full of nitrogen. And then banana leaves, which is an ancient Mayan technique I read about, uh, a mulching and putting down to plant little plantlets through to keep the weeds down. And banana leaves are full of um, great things similar to what a banana fruit is full of, like potassium and other nutrients. And then some leaves from the surrounding jungle and some other um, pine needles from some casuarina trees. So all local organic materials, we just layered it. It's, it's one of the techniques that's sometimes called lasagna gardening. And they would, those were all broken down within like two weeks. So we just slowly built up the soil by layering organic materials and raised the bed up. That same bed that you saw on the last slide was expanded and joined with a, a number of similar um, shaped beds into what is called a mandala shaped garden. You can see a little diagram of it in the upper left. And in our mandala garden, these are all raised beds, but also um, polycultural, so many different species in one place. We've got papayas around the edge, bananas in the center, um, basil, uh, something that's called culantro, which is like cilantro, sweet potatoes, yucca, which forms a root that's kind of like a sweet potato, all kinds of things mixed in here growing more like a natural forest would be diverse, all growing together. And the beds are, um, you can see how they're about three to four inches tall at this point. This is a few months later, where we continue to layer on organic materials and build up the soil within those beds. And it's good that we raise things up because that area got a lot of rain and sometimes flooded. So the, the raised beds really did save the plants. But this polycultural system is also um, something that's more sustainable. It deters pests. If you have a monoculture of all the same species, acres and acres of it, like we do here in the United States with corn, if you get one pest that likes corn, it, it can just go crazy. But in a polycultural system, we have lots of different species growing together in an agricultural field or garden. The pests come and might do some damage, but they get a little confused with scents and flavors and they can't find the same plant that they were just eating. So it tends to keep pest levels lower. And it also attracts a variety of other insects, some of which are predators on the pest insects. So that's a positive too. Another cultural positive to this garden was it mimicked the ancient Mayan techniques. So while I was there, I mean, if any of you have done international work, um, you might have had the same feeling that I did, which was, who am I to come down here and tell these Kekchi Mayan people how they should garden. You know, it was just, it was a very strange role to be in, but it was, fortunately, I kind of expected this. And I tried to keep a really um, kind of background, supportive, maybe humble role. And so we, we created this demonstration farm and garden, like to show them 
oh, here are some plants you could grow that are high in vitamin A and iron. And, um, and I thought if I used designs that were um, polycultural like this, they would be more um, used to seeing things like that and wouldn't see it as other, like, oh, here's this guy from the United States who's doing some you know, garden technique that's totally different than anything we've ever seen, and he's trying to you know, tell us what to do. Um, well, I did actually spend the first few months when I was down there um, visiting a lot of the villages, and I found myself speaking to um, the older um, people like uh, people over uh, 70 and 80 that were still doing gardens that were somewhat like this, a polycultural garden, a whole bunch of different species in one zone near their, their um, huts and dwellings. And the rest of the people, the younger people were doing big milpas and just corn and mostly just corn and some beans and they weren't doing these old style polycultures. So when I created this one in our garden, at least it mimicked something they had seen. Here's a picture of one of the first swales I ever made in the garden there in Eastern Guatemala. Um, and the swale you can see is a ditch on the uphill side and then the berm, all the soil that was in that ditch on the uh, downhill side of that piece of land. And the water would flow from left to right down the hill and then go into the ditch and catch the sediment. And some plants were planted up on the berm um, and this whole valley had a lot of good soil in it, but we didn't want it to erode. So these swales that were created were to catch any of the sediment that had been, that was eroding as water washed down the hill and catch it and let it um, sit there and accumulate. So it wasn't washing away into the river and, and um, away from the site. You can see some bananas that were planted there too and some pineapples and other things. But the swale, this ditch catching um, was for catching and holding the water, allowing the water to infiltrate instead of run off and erode with it. And that berm was for planting things higher up. This is a great strategy for the tropics. So the roots re remain drier and the plants do better. This is an image of chaya planted. Um, it can be, you can just take, break off branches and stems of the chaya and poke it in the ground. And it will root, at least it does in the tropics and it can create a living fence. This fence, as this grew up, it created a barrier and a fence for wild pigs to not be able to get through into the garden area. Um, and also the leaves of this chaya are, um, if when they're cooked, they're very high. They're, they're higher in iron normally and you need to cook them before you eat them. But it's a good food source, nutritious, helps provide a living fence. Um, and these are all things that would be useful in a tropical environment. This plant, too likes to have its roots not completely soggy and soaked, so we put it on the berm part of the swale. Here's a structure which is really useful in a number of situations. It's called a banana circle. So a big hole is dug out about two meters wide and about a meter and a half deep. And the soil from that hole is used to create a berm all the way around the edge of that hole. And then bananas planted on that berm in a circle. The bananas are planted in the berm, so they're up out of the flood zone and their roots are a little bit drier, which they like. And then all the green waste, the leaves and cuttings from that garden could be thrown into the center of that banana circle, which is a big hole, like a big compost pile. The um, uphill side of that berm has a notch in it, you can see, and that's where the water would flow into from um, the, above, the above part of the banana circle from the uphill side. So that is a water catchment, and it would also catch nutrients as water and new, uh, sediments would flow into the center of that banana circle. It would produce bananas and food. Um, there's medicinal plants growing on the berm too. Um, so it had many uses for, for one element, many functions, and um, also served to hold in water and organic matter, grow food, catch sediment, all those things. So banana circles are a really fun, useful, and functional element in a permaculture garden. We have some um, here in Southern California too. People can do things like this. Um, in Santa Barbara, there are bana uh, banana circles too. Can, can of banana circles is what uh, I call them because people will plant the plant canna in between the bananas and bananas and form this nice circular place where they can throw their, ref, their green waste refuse into the center. There's a little more detail on the banana circle if you ever wanna do one. 
I've seen them in permaculture. I haven't I've done this myself, but I've seen them where the center is um, has a little um, kind of uh, platform over that center that you can put down and use and have like an um, outdoor shower there in the middle of the circle of vegetation of bananas. And so when you take a shower, the water coming off of you goes to feed the plants around the edge of the banana circle. And it's just a really fun kind of idea for an outdoor shower. That would be, that type of situation would be considered like a gray water use of um, the banana circle because you're taking used water, one you've used to shower with and letting it go into the middle of the banana circle for, for hydrating the plants and soil nearby. And just in case you're wondering at this point, looking at this, this uh, presentation, like, wow, 58 slides, it's going to take forever. Well, a lot at the very end are um, pictures. So there's a lot of information, but there's a lot of pictures too. So um, should go faster than it looks like. Let's now talk about strategies for temperate climates. So climates that have kind of uh, wet and dry seasons, cold and warm seasons, so they have more significant seasons than the tropics. So in temperate zones, you're dealing with a limited growing season. You know, the, the growing season only lasts for a certain amount of time and then it gets too cold and, uh, when it approaches winter and then um, it gets too hot when you get into the middle of summer. So temperate zones, um, often are challenged with trying to extend the growing season. If you're a, a farmer or a permaculture designer, you're trying to create a situation where plants can grow longer than they normally would in that zone. So you might have um, ways that you position your plants to keep the cool air from entering your site. Like if you're in a valley and you have cold air drainage to keep those areas warmer um, in the fall. Um, you also might have um, cold frames or uh, plastic or glass greenhouses, which can extend your growing season in those areas. Um, plants growing next to a building that has some type of thermal mass, meaning stone or adobe or cob. If your building is made from that, it can absorb heat during the day and then release it at night. So plants close to that will do better when it, the weather starts to get colder they can last a little longer outside. So that's another way to do it. So protecting plants from frost doesn't mean running outside and covering everything every time it might frost because in a temperate climate, you know, maybe not Southern California, but a lot of areas of the United States, it gets cold consistently, really cold and plants can't survive unless they can go dormant. Um, so you want to do things to protect them in other ways that are more sustainable. Um, Purchasing and planting things that are adapted for high elevation, which has temperate climate usually, or cold climates, um, plants that can handle it is one thing to do. Don't put plants that, that are um, cold sensitive or frost sensitive. You want cold hardy, frost hardy plants in general, including vegetables. There are some that can handle those temperature extremes better. Um, also, like I said before, Growing shrubs and trees for a windbreak can also really reduce the effects of cold air and hot air on your plants and animals. And growing short seasoned annuals is gonna be really important. You have to make sure that the plants that you plant are going to be able to germinate, mature, flower and set seed or fruit in the season that you have. So you certainly wouldn't want to plant plants you know, too late in the season the growing season because they might grow and they might mature and start to flower and then you get your first snow or cold snap and then they're all gone. So they have to have a short growing season. So get plants that are adapted to that but then also try to extend the growing season um, by the methods I mentioned and by things like cold frames. It's just like a small movable greenhouse where you could put it out in the late winter and maybe line the bottom with fresh manure, which heats up the whole system. You put manure down, then put some soil on top of that, put your seeds in, put this, it's, it's almost like a box with a piece of glass on top. That is what a cold frame is, mini greenhouse. And you could start your seeds outside in your garden. And then by the time they're mature, you just lift that off and your plants are already growing in the ground. You've got two or three weeks, maybe a month, head start on the whole season by using those.
because normally you'd have to wait until the last frost is gone sometime in early May in the Midwest, where I used to live, um, that you'd have to wait. So the, the cold frames can really help. If you can ever um, integrate animals into your um, greenhouses, that is also a very useful way of heating the greenhouses. I helped build a chicken coop greenhouse in Ohio that had the chicken coop um, had openings between the chicken coop. It was built right up against the greenhouse and the chickens could um, walk back and forth. Their open space, their, their run was in the bottom of the greenhouse. They couldn't get to the plants because we had chicken wired, so, but they could be in the greenhouse and chickens put out eight, eight BTUs per pound per hour. Uh, BTU is an energy unit, British thermal unit, and it's, you know, they, they create heat. And so them running around underneath the plants in the greenhouse created the heat for that greenhouse. And it was very sustainable. You didn't have to provide gas heating or electric heating in the greenhouse. The chickens did it. And um, it was putting two things together, um, like reciprocity between those two elements. And then we got eggs and greens and meat all together without the use of excess fuel. Solviva is the name of the home of Anna Eddy, who built this sustainable, energy efficient home on Martha's Vineyard beginning in 1977. She um, had this idea and designed this home like this. She took a normal conventional home and then added a big wall of glass on the south facing side. So where the sun hits um, structures and homes, mainly here in the Northern Hemisphere. And she made openings between the pre-existing home and um, into that greenhouse area. So it's like building, attaching a big greenhouse on the south side of a building. And she's found it to be very energy efficient. Um, she was able to maintain the temperature inside that home at a nice, you know, 75 degrees average temperature without any extra fuel, no gas, no forced heat, no electric heat, just from the sun's um, rays coming through the greenhouse and the, the greenhouse having some um, water and stone thermal masses in it that could absorb that and release it slowly. She grew plants inside that greenhouse. She could walk back and forth between inside the pre-existing home, there were openings and doorways, um, and she had her, her bathtub out there where she could, you know, take a bath in hot water from solar heated water amongst all her plants. Um, it was very simple. Uh, another one of the things that she was really into was wastewater management. That was actually her main uh, motivation was creating, um, creating sustainable and on-site wastewater management, not having to use a municipal sewage system. And she did that with these, um, not using any chemicals too, she developed and invented this wastewater management system, which was sustainable, non-polluting and all on site. So she, she took care of all of her own and her family's solid waste right on site. Um, and like I said, didn't use any extra resources um, like for heating or wastewater management. Here's another one of her designs, adding this um, outer greenhouse to an existing home and putting solar on it. Just that alone creates more heat in your home and increases, of course, food production, reduces energy bills and costs. So there's a lot of simple things that can be done to make things more sustainable. And Anna Eddy's designs and home um, are just one example. Unfortunately, her home, um, at some point she had to sell the land and the next owner bulldozed the whole home. So <laughs> that was lost, but her, uh, her ideas and her designs are a real inspiration how very simple things can be done to improve the sustainability of a site and a dwelling. What you're looking at is an example of a cork and pork forest in Portugal. This is an orchard system with the cork oaks um, planted and sometimes natural, and they are used for um, 
harvesting the cork and the bark off of the cork oak trees, and those are sold to make corks for wine bottles throughout the world. And this is a very common practice in Portugal, but the thing that makes it more permacultural is it's the, um, the blending of two systems, raising a pork for meat and growing and raising cork for use in the wine industry. You put these two together and you've got uh, a system which is fairly self-sustainable. You have trees that are producing some kind of product, which is cork, and the acorns that fall down are, were being wasted until they decided to add these pigs to this system and the pigs go in and feed and grow on the acorns themselves as their main source of food. And acorns are very high in oils and proteins. So they're very nutritious for the pigs and actually create a really good high quality um, pork meat raised in that system. And the pigs um, defecate and they root around and they till the soil and add their fertilizer into the soil, which helps the oaks grow even more to produce more cork and uh, more acorns for the pigs to eat. So that's a more sustainable reciprocal type of system, the cork and pork. Here's an image of the cork and pork forest with the cork oak trees and the herd of pigs underneath. And these pigs in particular are feeding on all the acorns that are being produced from this one tree. This one tree is undergoing a process called masting. It's every few years, trees will produce a much higher amount of nuts or fruit or acorns than the other years. And different individual trees within that forest of oak trees um, take turns on masting. This is a particularly fruitful year and the pigs are chowing down. One more shot of the cork and pork forest, just showing the cork trees and the bark that has been recently stripped off them for production, but not so much that it takes away the cambium and damages the trees. These trees will grow the cork back after a few years. The third type of climate that we want to pay attention to in permaculture designs are drylands. And these are areas that aren't just necessarily deserts, but they are dry because the evaporation exceeds the precipitation. So they can be areas that are not true deserts in the vegetative sense, but are of areas where you have just too much desiccation. Maybe it's temporary or maybe long-term and areas like tropical areas wouldn't be called deserts, but they could still be dry lands. So tropically, uh, tropical dry lands are another area where you'd have to take into account about the soil's um, dryness and the high evaporation and low precipitation when you're doing your design. So here are some strategies. Retaining water, that's a main goal in dry lands. You want to, any water that comes to site needs to be retained. These can be achieved by sunken beds, drip systems using very little water to irrigate, gray water use, and mulching. Reducing light and wind, which are very strong. You have strong, intense sunlight and high winds usually in dry lands and deserts. So you want to reduce those and their impacts on your sensitive organisms like farm animals, humans, crops, create shade, wind breaks, etc. And building soils. Somewhat similar to tropical soils, dryland soils tend to be thin and nutrient poor. And you want to increase their organic matter with living and non-living mulches, compost, compost tea, etc. Build a microbial community and Dryland soils tend to be more alkaline, so you want to increase their acidity to some degree as an overall strategy. So check out this two-part video series of this project called um, Greening the Desert that was done in the country of Jordan. Um, it's a really interesting project done in an area, a permaculture design project, done in an area of the world that has very, very little rain. So it's almost completely flat too and um, with very simple techniques and a short period of time, soil was built and vegetation was returned to the site. So Jeff Lawton is the my teacher of permaculture. He's the one who certified me as a permaculture designer. So um, he's your granddad in the permaculture hierarchy. Um, check these out. 
Here are a series of slides from a permaculture site and community in Cuyama. It's about an hour north of Ojai. Um, it's called Quail Springs Permaculture Farm. So I'll show you a number of slides from there. Great examples of dryland farming. This is the high desert. This is part of Quail Springs Permaculture Farm. They have a classroom, which is a yurt. Um, they originally had um, all cob buildings on the site, but the county of Ventura deemed some of them illegal and they had to be taken down. That's why this yurt is here. But um, what you're looking at is you're looking uh, southwest. So um, it's really a very dry climate up here. It's a high desert with sagebrush and yuccas and things like that. And um, They've grown a lot of plants, um, like what you're looking at here is a locust plant, which is a nitrogen fixing plant, but plants that can hold the soil in and help enrich and build the soil, which tends to be very thin and uh, nutrient poor. So the more mulch they're using, like you're seeing some of the straw on the ground, the more plants they can grow to use as a living mulch and to improve the soil through nitrogen fixation, the better the soil will be and improve those soils for crops. This is an example of a small cob planter. They're growing, looks like chard and some other greens for the kitchen right outside the kitchen door here at Quail Springs. And they, you're seeing bottles that were used in the very top part of it just for fun and for decoration. So something used already. Um, but the, the main body of this planter is made with what's called cob, which is a clay, water, some sand and some kind of fiber like straw all mixed together. And it's like an adobe material, but it's a solid, uh, the whole thing is solid. It's not bricks put together separately, but all joined together into one monolithic structure. Examples of using sunken beds here at Quail Springs in this dry land. These beds were dug out into the clay and sand and compost and other good soils put into that area so that water will tend to um, travel down into the beds and so do sediments if there ever is precipitation. A large composting pile here at Quail Springs. Composting is really important, taking all the manure from the chickens and the goats and composting it because all of that uh, manure has tons of nutrients to help build these desert soils. The animals are a great way to get organic matter back into the soil picture of a class, a field trip from a permaculture class out at Quail Springs, um, putting in these rows of garlic into these sunken beds and then putting irrigation, drip irrigation, which is very conservative of water over those beds. And their compost pile at Quail Springs, another one, this is from the kitchen waste and letting the chickens roam th through it and eat it. They can turn some of that that waste into not just soil, but they can turn it into um, eggs and meat and feathers, all useful resources that come from the chicken. So what is the human waste can be food for the next organism in that food chain and can bring resources back to us. This is a picture of me milking one of the goats at Quail Springs. The reason they have a herd of goats there in that dry land is they can let them roam free on the land and the goats will eat a variety of the native plants, but without destroying the native plants, they eat them and um, they don't have to be fed extra food except what's on the land themselves. And they can turn that into um, a couple of resources. One is milk, another is meat, but the most important one in this dry land is their manure. The, um, the pellets that come from the goats can be composted and used to help build the soil. Um, desert soils are very nutrient poor, as I've said. So if you're going to live in them and work with nature, um, animals are a great way to turn the desert dry vegetation into soil biology. Um, and that's the natural way that deserts work. It's usually deserts have um, ungulates and other organisms that help build up the soil in little pockets here and there by eating the vegetation and their excrement becomes organic matter for the soil. And you can use that, humans can as farmers, by having this herd, which can take what would otherwise be just a wild, dry, scrubby desert climate and vegetation type, which is kind of not too useful to humans, 
but turn it into good, rich compost, which is very useful to humans. And just to be efficient, as permaculture likes to promote, milking right into my coffee cup. I have some relatives that live in Santa Fe and I saw this example of dry land um, water management where the front yards and often the fields for crops are, are at lower spots on the land. Um, this front yard here, you're seeing the very top of a fruit tree which has a trunk about four feet long which goes down to the front yard soil level which is well below that wall. So that's a depression and water will run down the hillside and come into the yard and remain there. That's how the yard gets irrigated and that's the best place to grow things. There's an ancient system of these waterways um, called sequias in Santa Fe that take the water from higher up in the mountains out of the creeks and channel it down into the milpas and um, other areas for crop growth that are all lower and, uh, and in depressions often. So that's a method for water catchment and storage and soil hydration in a dry land. The next few slides are from a place I visited in, near Fresno um, called Forestieri Gardens. And this is a man, um, Baldassare Forestieri. He moved here um, in about 1901 from Sicily and he bought some land and he thought he was gonna farm it like his family did in Sicily. And he found only a couple feet under uh, the level of the soil, the topsoil was this hard clay layer, this hard pan layer that was impenetrable. So the land he bought could not be farmed at all. He could not grow orchards there. But when he dug below that layer, there was pretty good rich soil underneath that um, so this is kind of just a fun example of an adaptation to a dry land. Fresno is dry for the most part and very hot in the summer. And he found when he dug below that thick layer of hard pan, sometimes called caliche, um, it is good soil and it's cool down there. And he started to build um, a network of tunnels and grow plants underneath that hard layer down about 10 to 12 feet from the surface and he found that he was able to grow things there and it was a more hospitable living environment too. You can see that hard pan layer crossing over that arch. Those kind of look like horizontal light layers of stone or soil. That's that hard, thick, clay, impenetrable layer. This is one of the oldest plants that he actually planted originally. It's a over a hundred year old grapevine. And you're seeing there where it is planted, that big, thick, old vine um, down on the bottom there is about 12 feet down from the surface of the regular surface of the soil. And it's cooler down there. There's better soil. It's a little bit shadier. So it's a pretty neat adaptation there to a dry climate. He also built um, a living area below the surface of the soil in these caves that he built out of the soil and out of the stone that was there underground, showing he was a little bedroom in that system of caves where it was much cooler and he could live there during the summers. Fire prone areas are part of dry land systems in general, like we have here in the chaparral and coastal sage scrub of the south coast. And we need to manage those with permaculture designs, any type of design, but especially in permaculture, to protect existing structures and animals and crops, but also work with the fire design, knowing that we will have periodic fire. That is something that has not been done in the United States so far cities and towns and roads and infrastructures are built without the th thought of how fire will affect them when fire comes through. Usually we plan our cities and infrastructure um, however we want them to and then when there's a fire we're shocked that fire came through. Although if we really looked at the history of the site we know that fire will pass through in certain ways in certain directions with certain dynamics that are predictable we just haven't planned for them. 
So permaculture design asks that we try to plan for as much of this as possible for fire movement and periodicity, for wildlife movement, water movement, all those things. So we need to change our approach from fighting fires to coexisting with fire as a natural and predictable, you know, somewhat predictable process. Some of the ways we can plan for and work with fire are reducing fuel near our structures, the things that we don't want to burn. Um, and that's just often a maintenance type of thing. We've got to reduce the fuels and people do that a lot around here. You'll see like um, fire, preventative fire um, days when you can uh, have as much green waste as you want. You can take out, you know, trim your trees away from the house and trim up the trees so they're not touching the ground and all that green waste can be put on the road and they'll be taken away. That is fire preventative maintenance. But also we can plant plants around our homes and structures and barns and things that uh, retard fire that are don't burn very well that reduce the fire flame length and reduce the heat of the fire as that fire approaches those structures it's very possible to do planting wind breaks is important too because fire follows wind so if you slow the wind down or move its direction the fire will slow down and the fire will also move its direction we can we can direct a fire to go where we want it to and where we don't want it to and using fire resistant plants, which is similar to what um, I already mentioned. Plants that contain a lot of water and don't have a lot of hard wood or fuel will, um, will resist fire burning at all or resist um, creating a very hot fire. Some things to keep in mind when doing a permaculture design that takes fire into consideration is think about the amount of fuel, the amount of wood, woody tissue, that is in the environment around your home or your dwelling or your farm. And the quality of that fuel, is it really dense and hard, which means it will burn long and hot? Or is it thin, like grasses, which will burn um, not nearly as hot as dense wood and burn very quickly? Um, those are things to think about. Wind speed and direction, as I said, fire follows wind and you can um, predict where the fire will go from the wind. And those of us around here know these things from having been through too many fires. N understand how fire moves with topography. It likes to travel uphill quickly, and um, usually the very tops are the most severely burned areas, the tops of those hills, the ridges. There's some other nuances to that, but that's something to think about. The radiant heat from a fire front, so just the heat, not the flames, often does a lot of damage itself. So fires, even if they just get close to a structure um, or animals, they can create a lot of damage. <clears throat> and of course, we're always trying to design to protect the most valuable and the most vulnerable systems. An example of topography in fire, let's just take fire out of the discussion for a second. Um, wind and air currents during the day will follow um, a canyon. They'll go up the canyon and up over the saddles on mountains. So if you have some kind of vulnerable structure or sensitive structure like a town or a house or animal pen in, um, in a valley up near the top near a ridge, which is called a saddle, um, that's going to be the place that the wind gets its highest speed and the fire becomes the most intense. That is not a good place to put those structures. So on the left, you're seeing kind of like a don't, and on the right, you're seeing a do. If you want to have your structures in that area, put them up out of the valley floor or up off of the lowest part of the saddle. Also homes near ridges, since ridges tend to be the most intensely burned, have them set back 50 to 100 feet off of the edge of the ridge from the slope you're seeing a, a top-down picture, 100 feet all the way around of setback from that slope's edge is gonna be the safest, rather than right, if your home is right on the edge of that slope, it'll get the, the biggest brunt of the fire. Here's a list of some of the local plant communities in the South Coast area. And you can see here that 
depending on which type of plant community it is, it will have different um, levels of burning, different levels of fuel within that plant community, um, and different levels of volatile oils that burn, make some things burn more easily than others. Like hard chaparral, or manzanita and buckbrush and ceanothus, the woody chaparral tissues tend to be hard and dense and burn hot, and there's a lot of fuel per acre, and also the plants have volatile oils that will burn quite easily. <clears throat> Coastal sage scrub, softer chaparral, um, burns more easily, but not as long, so it doesn't get as hot. And uh, then there's grasslands uh, in our area. It ignites easily, burns rapidly, and it has some fuel, but not nearly as much as the chaparrals do. <clears throat> and then oak woodlands, similar to a grassland with more fuel, and the oak trees rarely burn completely, just burns the grasses around them. So some ideas about plant communities and how they burn differently to take into consideration for your design. So does that mean that native plants are bad? They tend to burn. These chaparral plants burn really well. Well, it varies. Some are more flammable than others. There are a lot of our chaparral and even coastal sage scrub plants that are um, adapted to burning. They have oils in them that burn easily. So there, a lot of them are flammable um, and more flammable than exotic species. So just because it's a native plant doesn't mean it is um, going to deter fire or not burn well. We all know around here that our native vegetation burns pretty pretty well. But density matters, of course, of the wood. Um, we don't want to destroy the native ecosystems when we're doing thinning for fire, but we can, we can reduce the amount of fuel in a native system without um, taking out the plants themselves. That's often just done through pruning um, and clearing of shrubs and definitely taking out dead and down old wood. There are plenty of non-native plants like pine trees and eucalyptus and some palms that are even more flammable than the natives. So those have to be carefully accounted for in a design that's trying to reduce fire. Don't plant them if you don't have to. One of my permaculture designer friends calls these Canary Island pines flaming frisbees. When they get into a fire and start to burn, like in this image, one of the fronds can, can easily be picked up by the wind and thrown for quite a while. Um, it's been shown they can be traveled for up to a mile on the wind and cause fire where they land. Designing your home landscape or farm by zones is a idea that comes out of permaculture. And this is a diagram of the zone concept where you have a zone zero, that's where the dwelling is. Zone one are you would have plant certain things and have certain structures that are right near your home, zone two, three, and four. In a firescaping or a design to reduce fire threat, those zones are related to the type of vegetation. So the closer into your house you want to have the types of plants planted right around the dwelling that are um, fire retardant or have a very low ability to burn things that are full of a lot of water like succulents or very low grasses or highly watered and irrigated um, landscaping like tropicals or lawns, things like that. So things that burn hardly at all are the things that should be in zone one. Zone two, you start to have vegetation that can be a little less um, resistant to fire, but also low fuels, not a lot of density. And then zone three, you're moving out further where you're starting to plant things intentionally to stop the movement of fire and to slow the fire down and reduce the flame length and intensity of that fire. And then zone four is where you have um, thinned native vegetation and zone five is the vegetation is just wild. So the whole idea of firescaping in these zones is as the fire approaches your dwelling, it would be um, at its natural speed, but then it hits this thinned native vegetation zone and it slows down. The fire slows down and the heat goes down. And then it hits this next layer, the zone three, and it actually hits fire retardant plants, which knock the, the flame down even further and slows it down. And then once it hits zone two and one, you're hitting um, vegetation that is highly irrigated and usually full of water 
um, that um, will just stop a fire in its tracks because it can't burn anything further, and that is right around the dwelling. So that's one idea in firescaping with the zones. The next few slides describe each of those zones and some particular types of functions of the zone for protecting your landscape from fire and the types of plants that you would plant in those zones.